and the two raptures. Anyway, let's open with prayer. Father, we just thank you for opening the eyes of our understanding today, enlightening us to the hope of your calling as we study your Torah. Thank you for teaching us your ways, for preparing us, Father. We know that we're getting close to the end. We thank you that you never leave us, you never forsake us. And we give you the praise, honor, and the glory for it. Hashem Yeshua, Mashiach, in the name of Yeshua, our Messiah, we pray. Amen and amen. Hallelujah. Ki Tetzi is our Torah portion, and it comes from Devarim, or Deuteronomy, 21.10 through 25.19. It means when you go. Now, the Haftarah is Isaiah 54, 1 through 10, and the Gospel, which is actually what I'm going to teach on today, is Matthew 24, 29 through 42. And we're going to read that portion right now. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, the stars will fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and then all tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. So there's not a secret rapture, guys. Now I want us to, we're going to be studying the two resurrections and the two raptures. But the word rapture doesn't appear in our English Bible. So where does the term actually come from? Is it a false concept? No, it's actually the Latin translation of the Greek word harpazo. It's rapture or something similar to that. And But it comes from the Latin Vulgate. So it's not in our Greek or even English, but it, it's translated as catching away in 1 Thessalonians 2. But I want us to understand harpazo is the Greek word it means a violent snatching away, and um, we never have an example of that happening for anybody being taken to heaven. It's, it's used to take somebody from, like Stephen, he was raptured after the Ethiopian used it. It used the word harpazo. He's taken from a zot, or found from where the Ethiopian eunuch was over to a zotus, and it was like, like the transporter from Star Trek. Beam me up, Scotty, except it's from one place on earth to another. And it's never taken to heaven. Now, he could have used that word when he was talking about Enoch being taken up in Hebrews 11, but he did not use that word there. Enoch was translated, but it's not the Greek word harpazo. He was not raptured. So we need to understand rapture. We talked about it in the past. It's really the greater exodus, the first rapture anyway. It's when Yeshua comes back and he gathers all, all the lost sheep of the house of Israel from all the nations where he scattered them, the ones that have made him Lord, and the martyrs are going to be resurrected and they're going to get glorified bodies at the very beginning. And then the rest of the dead are going to live after the thousand years are over. Now we're going to look at those scriptures. But I wanted to kind of lay a little bit of groundwork. The rapture is a biblical concept, but it's not about taking us to heaven. It doesn't happen mid-trib, before the trib, or anything else. It's immediately after the tribulation of those days. And that's when Yeshua will gather his people. So let's continue to read verse 31. And he will send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they will gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. And I think uh, Mark actually adds from one end of earth to the other as well. So it's, it's going to be the martyrs, the ones that are dead in heaven, the ones at the fifth seal that we see in Revelation, and then also the ones that are alive and remain, like he talks about in 1 Thessalonians 4. Verse 32 says, Now learn this parable from the fig tree. When its branches has already become tender and puts forth leaves, you know that summer is near. In other words, there's going to be signs of these things coming. So you also, when you see all these things, know that it is near at the doors. Assuredly, I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away till all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. But of that day... An hour no one knows not even the angels of heaven but my father only so all these guys writing these books on the rapture you're false prophets because even Yeshua did not know the day or the hour now it tells us in another place we can know the times or the seasons the Moedim but no man knows the day or the hour Yeshua himself didn't know so if you think you got a revelation from Yeshua on this you didn't because he doesn't know only the father knows and the Father's not, didn't, if he didn't tell Yeshua, he's definitely not going to tell one of us. So we don't get this secret knowledge and secret information. It just doesn't work that way. Verse 37, But as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. 
For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and did not know until the flood came and took them all away. So also will be the coming of the Son of Man be. Then two men will be in the field. One will be taken, the other left. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken and the other left. So this is what we call the rapture. But I just recently had a brother teach that it's not the righteous that are raptured here, it's the wicked. Well, we're going to look at that scripture too, because that is a that is a parable of the wheat and the tares. The angels gather the tares first, put them in bundles, cast them in the fire, and they're burned. So we're going to look at that one too, because there's actually two raptures. That's not taught in Christianity. There's two resurrections. Christianity, for the most part, teaches if you don't get resurrected at the first resurrection, the second one's just everybody going to hell, and that's not what it says either. So, he says, watch therefore... For you do not know what hour your Lord is coming. So we're going to study the understanding of the two raptures and the day of Yahweh. The timing of the rapture has been a great topic of debate for many years, though it shouldn't be. It comes from Christianity about pre-trib, post-trib, mid-trib, all these different times of the rapture of the church. Well, guess what? There's no such thing as a church. It's a mistranslation. We are the commonwealth of Israel. Church is from the Greek word ekklesia, and if it was translated, it would be the assembly, or literally the assembly of God, which is where that denomination got their name from. They just translated the word. Or if it was a transliteration like baptism, it comes from the Greek word baptism. It means to fully immerse, like a sunken ship, or like dye in, in wool and, or cloth and dye. Completely submerged. Well, they weren't doing it at the time. They were just sprinkling, and so they had to make up a new word called baptism based on the phonetic sounds from the Greek word baptisma. So it's not translated, but it's transliterated. Church isn't either one. It's just a made-up word stuck in there, with a, and it's a false concept. Yahweh does not have a separate people. He has the house of Israel and the house of Judah. That's who the new covenant was made with. And that's the only people that he has covenants with. There are no covenant with Gentiles, and there's no such thing as a church. So there's no covenant with the church. It is the commonwealth of Israel. So the rapture has always been tied to the resurrection. The dead and Messiah will rise first. It's always been. Yeshua, Yeshua tells us exactly when he will resurrect those that belong to him. He leaves no questions whatsoever if we just listen to his words. Look at John 6, 39. And this is the Father's will which has sent me, that of all which he has given me, all, not some, but all that he has given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again at the last day. John 6, 40. And this is the will of him that sent me, that everyone which has seen the Son, everyone, not just some, but everyone which sees the Son and believes on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. John 6, 44. No man can come to me except the Father which has sent me draws him, and I will raise him up at the last day. John 6, 54. Whoso eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. So this is the Creator, Yeshua, the one that made us. He's telling us when he's going to raise us up. We can take his word for it. So Martha understood a little bit about this too. So in John 11, 24, Martha said unto him, I know that he shall rise again, talking about Lazarus, in the resurrection at the last day. So the resurrection at the last day was a common known thing back then. We kind of lost the meaning of it in modern times. But the last day is when all that belong to Yeshua will be raised. There will not be any raised at any other time because Yeshua is not lying. He's not a man that he should lie. These verses are very clear about this fact. Now the thing that we must do is determine when the last day actually is. What is the last day? <clears throat> Yeshua gives us our first clue in John 12, 48. He that rejects me and receives not my words has one that judges him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. Well, that's the great white throne he's talking about. That's when everybody's going to stand before him, and we're all going to have to give account. So the last day is when those who reject Yeshua will be judged. Like I said, it's the great white throne. This comes from Revelation 20, verse 11. And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. His glory is so intense. 
why there's going to be a new heavens and a new earth. And there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were open. And another book was open, which is the book of life. So there's plural books plus the book of life that's going to be open. Can somebody get that back door? It's open a little bit. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. You don't think works are important, guys? We're going to be judged by our works, and we're going to be rewarded or cast in the lake of fire based on our works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it. So is the dead in the sea wicked? Doesn't say, but not necessarily. And death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. Well, obviously hell, the dead there are wicked, but death holds everybody, righteous or wicked. And they were judged, every man according to their works. Every idle word is being recorded. Everything we do, it's all being recorded. And if we finish the race in Yeshua, His blood's going to cleanse us from all sin. It's going to have paid for it, and we'll be good. And then we'll be rewarded for the things that we did that were good, that stand at the test of the fire. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. It didn't say everybody that was there. It just said whoever wasn't found written in it. Because the ones that were found written in it will have eternal life. From Yeshua's first clue, we can see that the last day ends with the great white throne judgment. But when does the last day begin? That's the question. Now remember, the last day is tied to the resurrection. Revelation 20, verse 4 says, And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Yeshua, and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark on their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Messiah a thousand years. But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. So this is the first resurrection. So there's this very specific list. You've got the martyrs, and then you've got those that wouldn't worship the beast, wouldn't take his number or mark or anything like that, and they lived and reigned with Yeshua for a thousand years. Then the rest of the dead that's not in this list... We're going to live after the thousand years are over. So here we're told that the first resurrection takes place at the beginning of the thousand year reign of Messiah. Let's look at what Yeshua himself tells us in Matthew 24, 29. Again, immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of heaven shall be shaken. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn. And they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet. And they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. And then the, the Mark passage I was telling you about, verse 13, or chapter 13, verse 24. But in those days, after that great tribulation, we've got another witness. The sun shall be darkened, the moon shall not give her light, and the stars from heaven shall fall, and the powers that are in heaven shall be shaken. And then shall they see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. Then shall he send his angels, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from the uttermost parts of the earth to the uttermost parts of heaven. So there's going to be living and dead, resurrected, coming together, and the angels are going to gather us together, that specific list in Revelation 20, verse 4. And it's immediately after the tribulation. And Yeshua is referring from his thousand year, uh, for his thousand-year reign. Yeshua's elect are gathered from off the earth and from heaven at the sound of a great trumpet. Now this, this reminds you of any other verses. Let's look at the main rapture verse. It comes from 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 13. But I would not have you be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, those that have died already, that you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Yeshua died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Yeshua will God bring with him. When does God come back? We just read it in Revelation 20, where he's sitting on the throne, heaven and earth have fled from his face. They're not anymore. There's no more place found for him. So that's at the end of the thousand-year reign. 
But we know that very specific list is going to be resurrected at the beginning. But the rest of them, God are going to bring with them. For this we say unto you, by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain under the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. The dead are going to be raised first. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Messiah shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Again, these are the dead being raised first, those in heaven, then those that remain, those on the earth, all being gathered together with the voice of the archangel. He sends his angels to gather them, like we read, and with the trump of God. So Matthew 24, that Mark 13 passage, and 1 Thessalonians 4 are talking about the same event, basically. Now let's look at the other most popular rapture verse. It's from 1 Corinthians 15, verse 51. He says, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. We're not all going to die. But we shall all be changed in a moment. In the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. There's that trumpet again. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. So this verse gives us a very important clue. The dead shall be raised at the last trump. Although the seven trumpets of Revelation 7, uh, 10, 7 the seventh one takes place on the same day. It's not the last trump that he was talking about because Revelation hadn't been written yet. So he's talking about something different. I would also like to point out that this is not speaking of the Feast of Trumpets either as this is a rabbinic invention. If you study the Hebrew, trumpets is not in there. It's not the Feast of Trumpets. It is Yom Teruah. And we're going to look at that a little bit. The biblical name is Yom Teruah for the first day of the seventh month. The shofar is not mentioned in scripture concerning this day in the original Hebrew. It's just not there. A literal translation will reveal the literal meaning. Teruah can be translated different ways depending on the context. So let's look at Numbers 29.1 from the New Jerusalem Bible. It says, In the seventh month, on the first day of the month, you will hold a sacred assembly. You will do no heavy work. For this, for you, this will be a day of acclamation. Now, the King James and most modern versions talk about the day of trumpets or the feast of trumpets. But literally, it says the day of acclamation here. Now, Young's literal translation in the same verse says, And on the seventh month, in the first day of the month, is a holy convocation you're to have. You will do no servile work. It's a day of shouting it is to you. So there's, again, trumpets is not in the actual Hebrew. A literal translation or a better translation will reveal the true way it's supposed to be translated. And nowhere in the Torah is this specific day tied to the shofar in the original Hebrew. It's just not there. It was a rabbinic invention. And then the translators of the Tanakh, the Christian translators, followed the rabbinic. For some reason, they followed what the rabbis did. I don't know why. There's no logical reason for it. Now, the following verse uses Teruah also in the same context as is intended in Numbers 29.1. This is 1 Samuel 10.24. Samuel then said to all the people, You have seen the man whom Yahweh has chosen, and that among the whole people he has no equal. And all the people acclaimed him, or Teruah, shouting, Long live the king! So the day of acclamation, they were acclaiming Saul as their king. So Teruah is acclamation. It's done with shouting or it's an acclaiming something. It's the message. Now we can see this feast is fulfilled in Luke chapter 2 verse 8. It says, Now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields keeping watch over their flocks by night. And behold an angel of the Lord stood before them and the glory of the Lord shone round about them and they were greatly afraid. Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid for behold I bring you good tidings of great joy which will be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior who is Messiah the Lord. And this will be the sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill towards men. They are acclaiming the Messiah to the shepherds in the field. This is the day that Yeshua was born. They were shouting, glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill to men. 
This was a fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy in Isaiah 9, 6. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Talking about Yeshua. Now the King James translator followed the rabbinic tradition concerning the translation of this verse. Yom Teruah should be correctly translated as the day of acclamation. So if the last trump does not sound on Yom Teruah, see this was a smokescreen for the enemy to not let us know when he's actually returning. When does it sound? Look at Leviticus 25, verse 8. And you shall count seven Sabbaths of years for yourself. Seven times seven years. And the time of the seventh Sabbath of years shall be 49 years to you. Then you shall cause the trumpet, and this is shofar, of the jubilee, the yovel, to sound on the tenth day of the seventh month, on the day of atonement, Yom Kippur, is when the last trumpet is sounded. Because it ends the old jubilee cycle, and it's announcing the new one. And we sing that song, it's the year of jubilee, when the lame shall walk and the blind shall see, when the Lord will set the captives free. And that's what the Day of Atonement is all about. It's judging the wicked and returning everybody to their rightful inheritance. So on the Day of Atonement, you shall make the trumpet to sound throughout all your land. And you shall consecrate the 50th year and proclaim liberty throughout all the land to all its inhabitants. It shall be a jubilee for you. And each of you shall return to his possession, and each of you shall return to his family. So Yom Kippur is the day of the last trump. It's the last trumpet before the year of Jubilee. It's announced it's the day of liberty. Fits the feast perfectly. Fits everything that Paul is talking about. And this is the day that the slaves were set free. This is the day the rightful owner returns to his possession. You might have gotten poor and had to sell your spread to pay your bills or whatever, but every 50 years your family got that inheritance back because he didn't want the land to go away. He always wanted us to have an inheritance. He is a God that he says it's a blessing for a man to leave an inheritance to his children's children. That's what he's about. So the year of Jubilee is a picture of Yeshua's return, redeeming and restoring all things on earth to what appeared to be a pre-fall state. Yom Kippur also re represents deliverance and salvation for the repentant and judgment for the non-repentant. So this is the picture of the day of Yahweh. This is the last day that Yeshua is talking about. The day of Yahweh begins with specific heavenly signs. Look at Isaiah 13, 6. Howl ye. For the day of Yahweh is at hand. It shall come as a destruction from the Almighty. Therefore are, shall all hands be faint, and every man's heart shall melt. And they shall be afraid. Pangs of sorrow shall take hold of them. They shall be in pain as a woman that travails. They shall be amazed one at another. Their faces shall be as flames. Behold, the day of Yahweh comes, cruel, both with wrath and fierce anger, to lay the land desolate. And he shall destroy the sinners thereof out of it. For the stars of heaven and the constellation thereof shall not give their light. The sun shall be darkened and is going forth, and the moon shall not cause her light to shine. And I will punish the world for their evil and the wicked for their iniquity. And I will cause the arrogancy of the proud to cease, and will lay low the haughtiness of the terrible. I will make a man more precious than fine gold, even a man than the golden wedge of Ophir. Therefore I will shake the heavens, and the earth shall remove out of her place in the wrath of Yahweh's hosts, and in the day of his fierce anger. Now where did we just read about these signs? The sun not giving its light, the stars and heavens falling and all that was Matthew 24, verse 29. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. It's the day of Yahweh. That's when Yeshua returns at the beginning of the day of Yahweh. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. So the day of Yahweh is the day that Yeshua returns. It begins it. But it's not just a single day like we've been taught. 
the day of Yahweh also has a specific ending and encompasses a specific amount of time. 2 Peter 3 shows us what this is. Verse 8 says, But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day with the Lord is as a thousand years. And a thousand years is one day. That's taken from the Psalms 90, I believe. The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He's given them a thousand more years to do that. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Well, that didn't happen right at the beginning when Yeshua comes back. Peter's talking about the ending of the day of Yahweh, but he's telling us that it's a thousand year long period. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up, seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved. And when did we see that happen? Revelation 20, when he was sitting on the throne, the heavens and earth fled from his face and there was no more place found for them at the great white throne. What manner of persons ought you to be in all holy conversation and godliness? looking for and hastening unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promises, look for new heavens and a new earth, wherein dwells righteousness. So Peter lets us know that the day of Yahweh is a thousand years long. It's not just a single day, like in the creation story, evening in the morning, that was describing a single day. This is a thousand year long day. It's one of Yahweh's days. It begins with the stellar signs that we just discussed and it ends with the destruction of the heavens and the earth and the great white throne judgment. Now here Peter uses the same phrase as a thief in the night as Paul tells us in 1 Thessalonians below that we're fixing to look at. They're talking about the same day of Yahweh. These signs that you can track lets us know that these are events that are tied together. In prophecy, that's what you have to look for, because very, very rarely is it laid out in a linear fashion. It jumps all over the place. So you got to look for these different clues to stick them together to understand how the pieces fit. So Peter gives us additional insight by telling us that at this time the heavens will pass away, the elements will melt with fervent heat, and the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up, and all these things will be dissolved. Now this can only be at the end of the thousand-year-long day, because at the beginning of it, we're told that it'll take seven months to bury all the dead bodies and seven years to burn all the weapons of warfare. And this comes from Ezekiel 39, verse 9. Then those who dwell in the cities of Israel will go out and set on fire and burn the weapons, both the shields and the bucklers, the bows and the arrows, the javelins, the spears, and they will make fires with them for seven years. For seven months the house of Israel will be burying them in order to cleanse the land. That was verse 12, skipping to verse 12. So it takes seven years to burn all the weapons and seven months to bury all the bodies. Now let's look at that main rapture verse again. Remember, the original epistle had no chapters or verses. It was just one continuous flow. So we're going to start in chapter 4, but we're going to continue on into chapter 5 with no break. Verse 13 says, But I would not have you be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Yeshua died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Yeshua will God bring with him. And we know that the Father comes back at the end of the thousand year reign. So the majority of believers will be brought back by the Father at the end. But that very specific list we read in Revelation chapter 20 verse 4, they're going to be raised at the beginning. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of our, the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead and Messiah shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore come from one another with these words. But of the times and seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you. See, we can know the times or the seasons, just not the day or the hour. But the enemy tried to confuse things with the whole Feast of Trumpets. That's, that's where it's messed up. That's not when he's coming back. For you yourselves know perfectly well that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. Same words as what Peter was using. For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. 
But you, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. You are all children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. So Paul is clearly telling us that the rapture of the elect occurs at the day of Yahweh. This is the same day that we also call the thousand-year reign of Messiah Yeshua. It's the one day with Yahweh is it's a thousand years and a thousand years is a day. It begins with the stellar signs that we just discussed, and it ends with the destruction of everything, and then the great white throne judgment. So there's not going to be a pre-trip or mid-trip rapture. There's not going to be a rapture of a church at any time because there's no such thing. But for Israel, there's no pre-trip and no mid-trip rapture. All that belong to Yeshua will be raised at the last day. And that doesn't start until immediately after the tribulation of those days. And there's only two resurrections. Both take place on the last day. One's at the beginning, one's at the end. Now it's the beginning of the thousand year reign of Messiah Yeshua that we're going to look at. This is the day of Yahweh, Revelation 24. Again, this list. And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them. And judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them which were beheaded for the witness of Yeshua, the martyrs, and for the word. So all the martyrs throughout the ages, Hebrews 11, I didn't put it here, but it talks about how women had received the dead, raised to life again. But some, choosing rather uh, to suffer persecution, and in the Greek it's unto death, that they might obtain a better resurrection. Well, if there's only two, which one's better? The first one where you get it, it's a special reward. You're going to get your glorified body early. You're going to be a superhuman amongst the mortals, and you're going to be able to fly up in the air like doves and light on the windowsill and walk through walls, do everything Yeshua did. It's kind of a neat thing. We're going to be ruling and reigning with Yeshua for that thousand-year reign with glorified bodies if you're in the specific list. So if you're a martyr, you're going to be resurrected, and you're going to be able to rule and reign with Yeshua during this time. Um, they were beheaded for the witness of Yeshua for his word, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image. So it's talking about end time saints that are here for the last great trial of the beast. That neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Messiah a thousand years. So the angels are gathering from the four corners of heaven, the martyrs, and then also from the four corners of the earth, the ones that made it through that didn't take the mark. There is a place of protection that he's got for us. We're not studying that this time, but we've looked at it in the past, and there will be those that make it through without taking the mark. And they're going to have a special reward, too, for going through this last great trial like the earth has never seen before. And they will be rewarded if we endure to the end. That's the key. And they lived and reigned with Messiah a thousand years, but the rest of the dead, everybody else not mentioned in this specific list, which would include Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the ones that didn't die as martyrs, they're going to be, David, yeah, they're all going to be resurrected at the end when God comes back and brings everybody with him. So the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Very specific list. He tells us exactly who's going to be raised. So the first resurrection occurs right after the battle of Gog and Magog. Now we're going to look at that because Gog and Magog are actually markers of the great last day. Gog and Magog we have at the very beginning, and then at the very end we've got Gog and Magog again. We're going to look at that. Look at Ezekiel 38, starting at verse 18. And it shall come to pass at the same time when Gog shall come against the land of Israel, thus says the Lord God, that my fury shall come up in my face. For in my jealousy and in the fire of my wrath have I spoken. Surely in that day there shall be a great shaking in the land of Israel, so that the fishes of the sea and the fowls of the heaven and the beasts of the field and all creeping things that creep upon the earth and all the men that are upon the face of the earth shall shake at my presence. And the mountains shall be thrown down, and the steep places shall fall, and every wall shall fall to the ground. Guess what? It's going to flatten the temple that the Antichrist is going to profane too. Yeshua is going to build a new one. Now, the temple that's going to be built, it's going to be legitimate as long as it's done according to Torah until the Antichrist sits himself in the temple of God proclaiming himself to be God. Then it's defiled at that point. We don't meet there anymore. But until that time, that's actually what's going to draw us back to Israel so that we'll be there for the place of protection. And that's kind of our home base. And then we're going to go out and win the world from that location. And verse 21, And I will call for a sword against him throughout all my mountains. 
Thus says the Lord God, For every man's sword shall be against his brother, and I will plead against him with pestilence and with blood, and I will rain upon him and upon his bands and upon the many peoples that are with him an overflowing rain and great hailstones. It's another one of the signs to track, the great hailstones, fire and brimstone. Thus will I magnify myself and sanctify myself, and I will be known in the eyes of many nations, and they shall know that I am Yahweh. Chapter 39, Therefore, you son of man, prophesy against Gog, and say, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against you, O Gog, the chief prince of Meshech and Tubal. That's his first guy, but Gog comes up again. So actually, Gog is a demon. Now, he does have a physical host, but it is a demon that's named Gog. And he's got different names at the beginning, the beast, the Antichrist. But he's going to be at the end as well, after the thousand years, as we're going to see. So it's it's a spirit, and it, and it occupies a specific man to start with, and then it's going to be a different man later on. But it's the spirit that we're talking about. The chief prince of Meshach and Tubal. Remember when Michael was having to battle the chief prince of Persia and Gabriel had to break through and it took 21 days to get down there? So these chief princes, are there's demonic powers in the heavenlies that operate with the authority of the men on the ground. So it's kind of a spirit and truth kind of thing. And I will turn you back and leave but the sixth part of you and will cause three to come up from the north parts and will bring you upon the mountains of Israel. And I will smite your bow out of your left hand it gives you a clue as to who the rider of the black horse is in Revelation, chapter 6. I'm going to smite the bow out of your left hand, and I will cause your arrows to fall out of your right hand. You shall fall upon the mountains of Israel, you and all your bands and all the people that is with you. I will give you unto the ravenous birds of every sort and to the beasts of the field to be devoured. You shall fall upon the open field, for I have spoken it, says the Lord God. And I will send fire on Magog, and among them that dwell carelessly in the isles, and they shall know that I am Yahweh. So will I make my holy name known in the midst of the people of Israel, and I will not let them pollute my holy name any more. And the heathen shall know that I am Yahweh, the Holy One of Israel. Behold, it is come, and it is done, says the Lord God. This is the day whereof I have spoken, and they that dwell in the cities of Israel shall go forth, and shall send on, set on fire and burn the weapons, both the shields and the bucklers, the bows and the arrows, and the hand staves and the spears, they shall burn them with fire for seven years. So they shall take no wood out of the field, neither cut down any out of the forest, for they shall burn the weapons with fire, and they shall spoil these that spoiled them, and rob those that robbed them, says the Lord God. And it shall come to pass in that day that I will give unto Gog a place there of graves in Israel, the valley of the passengers of the east of the sea, and it shall stop the noises, or the noses of the passengers, and there they shall bury Gog and all his multitude, and they shall call it the Valley of Haman Gog. And seven months shall the house of Israel be burying of them, that they may cleanse the land. So it's going to stink really bad for seven months, and then they're going to get them all buried. Yea, all the people of the land shall bury them, and it shall be to them a renown the day that I shall be glorified, says the Lord God. And they shall sever out of men of continual employment employment passing through the land to bury with the passengers those that remain upon the face of the earth to cleanse it after the end of seven months shall they search and the passengers that pass through the land when any sees a man's bone he shall set up a sign by it till the barriers have buried it in the valley of Haman Gog and also the name of the city shall be Hamonoth or Hamonon thus they shall cleanse the land and you son of man Thus says the Lord God. Now this is the clue that ties this to another passage we're going to look at. Speak unto the feathered fowl, and to every beast of the field, assemble yourselves and come. Gather yourselves on every side to my sacrifice, that I do sacrifice for you, even a great sacrifice upon the mountains of Israel, that you may eat the flesh and drink the blood. You shall eat the flesh of the mighty and drink the blood of the princes of the earth, of rams, of lambs, of goats, of bullocks, all of them fatlings of Bashan. And you shall eat fat till you be full, and drink blood till you be drunken, of my sacrifice which I have sacrificed for you. Thus you shall be filled at my table with horses and chariots, with mighty men, and with all men of war, says the Lord God. So most Christian theologians will teach that this is some war that happened sometime before the end and all this other stuff, and they don't tie it to what we're about to see that it actually is. John tells us about these same events in this battle in Revelation. 
Look at chapter 16, verse 12. And the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates. And the water thereof was dried up, that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, and out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are the spirits of devils, working miracles, which go forth into the kings of the earth, of that whole world, and gather them to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watch and keeps his garments, lest he walk naked, and they see his shame. And he gathered them together into the place called in the Hebrew tongue, Armageddon is what it says in, in English. Har Megiddo is what it is in Hebrew. It's the mountain of Megiddo. And we were in Israel in 99 on Har Megiddo, looking at the valley where this great thing is going to take place. When they dropped a bunch of bombs up in Lebanon, you could hear it just blasting, and it's just really picturesque of what's coming. Anyway, the seventh angel poured out his vial into the air, and there came a great voice out of the temple of heaven from the throne saying, It is done. And there were voices and thunders and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake such as was not since men were upon the earth, so mighty an earthquake. This is when he levels everything. The temple is going to be destroyed. It was so great. And the great city was divided into three parts. Zechariah 14.4 talks about that. And the cities of the nations fell. And great Babylon came in remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. And every island fled away. And it talks about that in Revelation 6.14 also. See, Revelation is put together again where you've got to look at all these clues to be able to see. Because it's not a continuous timeline. It's not... It doesn't start like in chapter 1 and finish in chapter 22. It's, it flips all around and goes all through the different timelines. So you've got to look for these clues. Every island fled away and the mountains were not found. Temple Mount <coughs> leveled. And there fell upon men great hail. We just read about that in Ezekiel 38, 22. Out of heaven, every stone about the weight of a talent. That's 70, 75 pounds. That's some pretty big hail. It's going to punch right through some most roofs if you're not in an underground bunker or something. And men blaspheme God because of the plague of the hail, for the plague thereof was exceedingly great. Now, Revelation 19, 17. And I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, we just read that in Ezekiel 39, Come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God, that you may eat the flesh of kings and the flesh of captains and the flesh of mighty men and the flesh of horses and them that sit on them and the flesh of all men, both free and bond, both small and great. And we just read that in Ezekiel 39, 17 through 20. Gog and Magog, that battle is the battle of Armageddon. It is the beast, what we call the Antichrist, and that is when he is judged and destroyed. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and all their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, and which had deceived them that received the mark of the beast, and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. And the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, which sword proceeded out of his mouth, and all the fowls of the earth or fowls were filled with their flesh. Just like in Ezekiel 39. So the war of Gog and Magog that Ezekiel tells us about is none other than the battle of Armageddon. The battle that begins the day of Yahweh. It's when Yeshua returns. This takes place right before the beginning of the thousand year reign of Messiah Yeshua. Yeshua comes and destroys the armies of the earth with the sword of his mouth and sends his angels to gather his elect. Just like we read in Matthew 24. We're going to look at it again from our Torah portion, or the Gospel portion. But as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark, and did not know until the flood came and took them all away. So also will the coming of the Son of Man be. Then two men will be in the field. One will be taken and the other left. Now these are the elect. This is not the tares, because that's a different time. So these are the elect being taken. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken and the other left. Watch therefore, for you do not know what hour your Lord is coming. But know this, that if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore you also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming in an hour that you do not expect. 
So all your rapture books are wrong, guys. So at the end of the thousand year reign, we have Gog and Magog appearing again right before the second resurrection because they're markers at the beginning and the end of what we call the day of Yahweh or the last day like Yeshua said. Look at Revelation 20 verse 8. And Satan shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth. See, he's been bound for a thousand years and then he's released for a short season. Gog and Magog to gather them together to battle. So the same demons are there again. The number of whom is as the sand of the sea. I mean, this is a huge amount of people like the sand of the sea. That's like the nation of Israel that was in the blessing. So this is a huge amount of people. And they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about and the beloved city. And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. And this, I believe, is when the Father actually just returns. His glory is just so intense, it melts everything. That's the fire. And the devil that deceived them was cast in the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled. The face is what emanates the glory for the most part. When Moses came down and his face was shining, and Yeshua, his whole body was shining, but primarily it would have been out of his face. And there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books, according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, good and bad. Death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. Death, maybe bad, maybe good, but hell, definitely bad. And they were judged, every man, according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. Death and hell are actually spirits too. This is the second death. And whoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Not everybody, just those that weren't found written in the book. So these events that lead up to the second and last resurrection are at the great white throne. These are the events that will lead to it. The last resurrection and the great white throne. So Yeshua tells us who will be gathered first at the second rapture and resurrection. This is where this parable fits in now. Matthew 13, 24. Another parable he put forth to them saying, the kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the grain had sprouted and produced a crop, then the tares also appeared. So the servants of the owner came to him and said, sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tares? He said to them, An enemy has done this. The servant said to him, Do you want us to go out and gather them up? But he said, No, lest while you gather up the tares, you also uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow until the harvest. And at the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, First gather together the tares and bind them into bundles and burn them. But gather the wheat into my barn. And then skipping to verse 36, it says, Then Yeshua sent the multitude away, and went into the house, and his disciples came to him, saying, Explain to us the parable of the tares of the field. He answered and said to them, He who sows the good seed is the Son of Man. The field is the world. The good seed are the sons of the kingdom, but the tares are the sons of the wicked one. The enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are the angels. Therefore, as the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the age. Not the beginning of the day of the Lord, but at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send out His angels, and they will gather out of His kingdom all things that offend, and those who practice lawlessness, and will cast them into the furnace of fire. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their Father. Where is that? That's the new heavens and new earth. That's the new Jerusalem. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. That's when the Father shows up. So that's when this is actually fulfilled. So all the prophecies as we study in the Tanakh and even in the Brit Hadashah, they're either describing the events at the beginning of the day of the Lord or at the end, if they're talking about that day. They're not always talking about the same thing, so you've got to look for the clues. So the kingdom of the Father, like I said, is in the new Jerusalem and the new earth. Now, all of these events leading up to the kingdom of the Father occurs at the last day that Yeshua is telling us about. 
We're all resurrected at the last day, just some at the beginning and some at the end. There is no resurrection of Yeshua's people at any other time, according to the Messiah. Again, John 6, 39. And this is the Father's will, which has sent me, that of all which he has given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again at the last day. So it's pretty simple if we take Yeshua at his word. The last day, or the day of Yahweh, is written about by almost all of the prophets. Now, it's not a day that we're to desire. Some of the prophecies are describing the beginning of this day, and some describe the end, like I said. Look at Amos 5.18. Woe unto you that desire, desire the day of Yahweh. To what end is it for you? The day of Yahweh is darkness and not light. Now, this is describing the beginning and the very end. In the middle of it, Yeshua is ruling in the midst of his enemies, it tells us in Psalms 110, with a rod of iron. So it's not going to be destruction like the whole time, but at the very beginning and at the very end, there is massive destruction. <coughs> Isaiah 13, 6. Howl ye, for the day of Yahweh is at hand. It shall come as a destruction from the Almighty. Therefore shall all hands be faint, and every man's heart shall melt, and they shall be afraid. <coughs> Pangs of sorrow shall take hold of them, and they shall be in pain as a woman that travails. They shall be amazed at one another. Their faces shall be as flames. Behold, the day of Yahweh comes cruel, both with wrath and fierce anger, to lay the land desolate, and he shall destroy the sinners that are out of it. When does he do that? At the very end. He wipes out the armies at the beginning, as we're going to see. For the stars of heaven and the constellation thereof shall not give their light. The sun shall be darkened, and it's going forth, and the moon shall not cause her light to shine. So this happens at the beginning, these stellar signs. And I will punish the world for their evil, and the wicked for their iniquity. And I will cause the arrogancy of the proud to cease, and will lay low the haughtiness of the terrible. I will make a man more precious than fine gold, even a man than the golden wedge of Ophir. So when does this happen? At the end, because... During the thousand year reign, a little child becomes a mighty nation. There's prolific childbirth. So it's not talking about the whole time of the, the last day. But mankind's going to be wiped out at the end. Therefore, I will shake the heavens and the earth shall remove out of her place in the wrath of Yahweh of hosts in the day of his fierce anger. <coughs> so his anger is concentrated at the beginning, the armies that have gathered at, at Jerusalem, as we're going to see, and then at the very end the ones that gathers the sand of the seashore, Gog and Magog. Both places, it's Gog and Magog he's dealing with, with fierce anger. So again, notice the stellar signs associated with the beginning of this day. These signs help us track the beginning of this day throughout Scripture. We can go ahead and probably kill Channel 7. That might be what that noise is. So we can study about this day to prepare for it, but we must not desire it. Look at Joel 2.1. Blow you the trumpet in Zion. And sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble. For the day of Yahweh comes. For it is nigh at hand. A day of darkness and of gloominess. A day of clouds and of thick darkness. As of the morning spread upon the mountains. A great people and a strong. There has not been ever the light. Neither shall there be any more after it. Even to the years of many generations. A fire devours before them. And behind them a flame burns. The land is as the Garden of Eden before them, and behind them a desolate wilderness. Yea, and nothing shall escape them. The appearance of them is like the appearance of horses, as of horsemen, so they shall run. Like the noise of chariots on the tops of mountains, shall they leap. Like the noise of flame of fire that devours the stubble, as a strong people set in battle array. Before their face the people shall be much pain. All faces shall gather blackness. They shall run like mighty men. They shall climb the wall like men of war, and they shall march everyone on his way. They shall not break their, break their ranks. Neither shall one thrust another, that they shall walk everyone in his path. And when they fall upon the sword, they shall not be wounded. They shall run to and fro in the city. They shall run upon the wall. They shall climb up upon the houses. They shall enter in at the windows like a thief. The earth shall quake before them. Again, the same earthquake. The heavens shall tremble, the sun and the moon shall be dark, and the stars shall withdraw their signing. And Yahweh shall utter his voice before his army, for his camp is very great, and he is strong that executes his word. For the day of Yahweh is great and very terrible, and who can abide it? Skipping to verse 31. The sun shall be turned into darkness, 
and the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of Yahweh comes. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call upon the name of Yahweh shall be delivered. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance, as Yahweh has said, and in the remnant of who Yahweh shall call. Again, Joel 3.14. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. For the day of Yahweh is near in the valley of decision. The sun and the moon shall be darkened. The stars shall withdraw their shining. Yahweh shall roar out of Zion and shall utter his voice from Jerusalem. And the heavens and the earth shall shake. But Yahweh be, will be the hope of his people and the strength of the children of Israel. So it's going to be dark. It's going to be bad. But Yahweh's going to be there with us in the middle of it. So Joel gives us much information about the beginning of the day of Yahweh. It's referred to in Revelation at the sixth seal as well. Look at Joel 2.30 again. And I will show wonders in the heavens and on the earth, blood and fire, pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood. Remember the blood moon thing? Before the great and terrible day of Yahweh come. And it shall come to pass that whoever shall call upon the name of Yahweh shall be delivered. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance, as Yahweh has said, and the remnant whom Yahweh shall call. So again, these clues, the blood moon, that's one thing to look for. It's in Revelation 6 also, verse 12. And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake. The sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood. And the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree casts her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. And the heaven departed as a scroll when it's rolled together. And every mountain and island were moved out of their places. And the kings of the earth, the great men and the rich men and the chief captains and the mighty men and every bondman, every free man, hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come and who shall be able to stand? So the sixth seal in Revelation 6 is another place in the book of Revelation that refers to the day of Yahweh, when it occurs. And we not only see it in Joel, but it's in Isaiah too, because Revelation is pulling from all the different prophets. Look at Isaiah 34, 1. Come near, you nations, to hear, and hearken, you people. Let the earth hear, and all that is therein, the world and all things that come forth upon of it. For the indignation of Yahweh is upon all nations, and his fury upon all their armies. He has utterly destroyed them. He has delivered them to the slaughter. Their slain also shall be cast out. Their stink shall come up out of their carcasses, and the mountains shall be melted with their blood. And all the hosts of heaven shall be dissolved, and the heavens shall roll together as a scroll. And all their hosts shall fall down as the leaf falls off the vine, and as the falling fig from the fig tree. We just read that in Revelation 6 also. And then Isaiah 2, verse 10. Enter the rock. And hide thee in the dust for fear of Yahweh and for the glory of his majesty. The lofty look down man shall be humbled and the haughtiness of men shall be bowed down. And Yahweh alone shall be exalted in that day. For the day of Yahweh of hosts shall come upon everyone that is proud and lofty and upon everyone that is lifted up. And he shall be brought low and upon the cedars of Lebanon that are high and lifted up and upon the oaks of Bashan and upon all the high mountains and upon every hill that are lifted up and upon every high tower, and upon every fenced wall, and upon all the ships of Tarshish, and upon all pleasant pictures. And the loftiness of man shall be bowed down, and the haughtiness of man shall be made low, and Yahweh alone shall be exalted in that day. And the idols he shall utterly abolish. And they shall go into the holes of the rocks, and the caves of the earth, for fear of Yahweh and for the glory of his majesty, when he arises to shake terribly the earth. So we can see where John's pulling from. Obviously, Yeshua's show, showing them how it all fits together. But the other prophets prophesied the same thing. So it makes it easier to track this day if we look for the major clues. The sun being darkened, the moon not giving its light or turning to blood, the stars being darkened and falling from heaven, a great earthquake and great hail. These are the clues that help you track it all through the scriptures. Now, most of the prophets tell us about the beginning of the day of Yahweh. Peter tells us about the end, when the elements would melt with fervent heat, and everything therein would be burned up, everything. That doesn't happen until the very end. Zephaniah is the one of the prophets that gives us details of both the beginning and the end of the day of Yahweh. Zephaniah 1.7. He says, Hold your peace at the presence of the Lord God, for the day of Yahweh is at hand. 
For Yahweh has prepared a sacrifice. He has bid his guests, and it shall come to pass in the day of Yahweh's sacrifice that I will punish the princes and the king's children, the, everything the birds are going to come and eat, and all such as are clothed with strange apparel. In the same day also will I punish all those that leap on the threshold, which fill their masters', masters houses with violence and deceit. And it shall come to pass in that day, says Yahweh, that there shall be a noise of a cry from the fish gate, and a howling from the second, and for a great crashing from the hills. Howl, you inhabitants of Maktesh, for all the merchant people are cut down, all they that bear silver are cut off. And it shall come to pass at that time that I will search Jerusalem with candles and punish the men that are settled out of their lees, or on their lees, that say in their heart, Yahweh will not do good, neither will he do evil. Therefore their goods shall become a booty, and their house is a desolation. They shall also build houses, but not inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards, but shall not drink the wine thereof, because Yahweh is gathering the nations of the earth together at Jerusalem. Verse 14, The great day of Yahweh is near. It is near, and haste greatly, even the voice of the day of Yahweh. The mighty men shall cry there bitterly. That day is the day of wrath, a day of trouble and distress, a day of wastedness and desolation, a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness, a day of trumpets and the alarm against the fenced cities and against the high towers. And I will bring distress upon men that they shall walk like blind men, because they have sinned against Yahweh, and their blood shall be poured out as dust, and their flesh as the dung. Neither their silver nor their gold shall be able to deliver them in the day of Yahweh's wrath, but the whole land shall be devoured by the fire of his jealousy. So that's at the end. For he shall make even a speedy riddance of all of them that dwell in the land. So Zephaniah covers it all from the beginning and then to the end. Now it doesn't describe the thousand year reign of Mashiach in detail, but the destruction at the beginning and the destruction at the end. So we see the the fire fall at the end of the day of Yahweh in Revelation 27. When the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, and gather them together to battle, the another number of whom is as the sand of the sea. And they went out upon the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about and the beloved city, and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. So this is the time that Peter's writing about. 2 Peter 3, 8. But beloved, be not ignorant this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away in the, with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat, the earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up, seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved. So again, the elements melt. The earth is again formless and void. This is what happens right before the new heavens and the new earth actually appear. Right when the great white throne is going to happen. Zechariah 14.1 And this talks about the beginning of the day of Yahweh again. Behold, the day of Yahweh comes, and your spoil shall be divided in the midst of you. For I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle. Because Jerusalem has become like Sodom and Egypt, according to Revelation. It's, it's wicked. The, one of the largest gay prides on earth happens in Tel Aviv. I think it is actually the biggest one. I mean, it's, it's crazy what Satan's trying to do to corrupt the land over there, to make it where Yahweh doesn't want it anymore. But he doesn't succeed. For I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city shall be taken, and the houses rifled, and the women ravished. And half the city shall go forth into captivity, and the residue of the people shall not be cut off from the city. Then shall Yahweh go forth. Now this is after the tribulation period when he goes forth. So we've got 42 months in between verse 2 and 3 that we see in Revelation 11 if we go over there. We're not going to do that right now. It talks about the Gentiles treading underfoot the holy city for 42 months. Then shall go forth, Yahweh will go forth and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle. And his feet shall stand that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem, on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof, towards the east and towards the west. There shall be a great valley, and half the mountain shall be removed towards the north, and half of it towards the south. And you shall flee to the valley of the mountains, 
for the valley of the mountain shall reach unto Azal. Now this is the first place we're supposed to flee that is the place of protection. You shall flee to the valley of the mountains, for the valley of the mountain shall reach unto Azal, and that's right south of the Mount of Olives in Jerusalem, right outside Jerusalem. Yea, you shall flee like as you fled from before the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. And Judah, Yahweh my God shall come, and all the saints with thee. And it shall come to pass in that day that the light shall not be clear nor dark, but it shall be one day which shall be known to Yahweh, not day nor night. But it shall come to pass that at evening time it shall be light. And it shall be in that day that living water shall go out from Jerusalem, half of them towards the former sea and half of them towards the hinder sea. In summer and in winter shall it be. And Yahweh shall be king over all the earth. In that day shall there be one Yahweh and his name one. All the land shall be turned as the plain from Geba to Ramon, south of Jerusalem. And it shall be lifted up and inhabited in her place from Benjamin's gate unto the place of the first gate, unto the corner gate, from the tower of Hananiel unto the king's winepress. And men shall dwell in it, and there shall be no more utter destruction, but Jerusalem shall be safely inhabited. And this shall be the plague wherewith Yahweh will smite the people that have fought against Jerusalem. Their flesh shall consume away while they stand upon their feet, and their eyes shall consume away in their holes, and their tongues shall consume away in their mouth. And it shall come to pass in that day that a great tumult from Yahweh shall be among them. And they shall lay hold every one on hand of his neighbor, and his hand shall rise against the hand of his neighbor. And Judah also shall fight at Jerusalem. And the wealth of all the heathen round about shall be gathered together, gold and silver and apparel in great abundance. And so shall be the plague of the horses, and the mule of the camels, and of the ass, and all the beasts that shall be in these tents as of this plague. And it shall come to pass that every one that is left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem so he's wiping out the armies, but the people that are left back at home shall go even up from year to year to worship the king, Yahweh of hosts, and to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. And it shall be whoever will not come up of all the families on the earth unto Jerusalem to worship the king, Yahweh of hosts, even upon them shall be no rain. So there's still a bunch of people left. He's still ruling in the midst of his enemies. And if they don't come up, they get a curse and they don't get any rain. But they're still here. He's kind of judging him as he goes, ruling in the midst of his enemies with a rod of iron. Zechariah tells us of the beginning of the 42 months of tribulation leading to the day of Yahweh. He describes Yeshua destroying the armies with the sword of his mouth, the armies being con uh, confused and killing each other, and even tells us that Judah will be fighting in the battle. So at this time only, the armies that come against Jerusalem are destroyed. Not all the wicked, just the armies. This does not describe the earth being destroyed by fire. This doesn't happen until the end of the thousand year reign. The end of the day of Yahweh. Now in between the destruction that marks the beginning and the end of this day, the wars of Gog and Magog, their markers, Yeshua will be ruling, like I said, all nations with a rod of iron, cursing the mortals who refuse to learn his ways and come for the feast of Sukkot or tabernacles. Now we have to heed carefully Yeshua's warning. We have to endure until the end. He's given us all these instructions so that we'll know what's coming and it won't take us by surprise. We're going to make it. Matthew 24, 11. And many false prophets shall arise and shall deceive many. And it's happening right now all over the earth. And because iniquity shall abound, lawlessness shall abound. It's that Greek word, anomia. The love or agape of many or even most will wax cold. But he that shall endure unto the end the same shall be saved. So we've got some enduring to do. It's not going to be fun, but we're going to do it by faith because he's prepared it for it right now. All these trials we're going through is getting us ready from what's lying ahead. Now, though these times are going to be dark, there's always light at the end of the tunnel. Amen. Luke 21, 28. And when these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads for your redemption draws nigh or draws near. Yeshua is returning. Mm -hmm. Be encouraged by keeping our eyes. We've got to keep them on the Master as we endure to the end. Just like it talks about in Hebrews, for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and is now set down at the right hand of the Father. That's the key. We've got to keep our eyes on him. Keep our eyes on the answer, not on the problems. Doesn't mean the wind and the waves are not real. But the master's there, and we've got to keep our eyes on him. 
because we're going to make it. He wants us to make it. He wants us to be the light of the world. The greatest harvest this earth has ever seen comes out of the midst of the great tribulation from all nations. We're here to help bring in this harvest. We're here for such a time as this. Let's pray. Father, I just thank you for the honor of being your people, your children, Israel. You have made us a kingdom of priests. And I thank you for the blessing on your people, Israel. Yivarechecha Yahweh Vayishmarecha Ya'er Yahweh Penavilecha Vihunecha Yisa May Yahweh bless you and keep you. May Yahweh make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May Yahweh lift up his countenance towards you and give you his peace, his shalom. In the name of Yeshua, our Messiah, we pray. Amen. Be patient. Keep your eyes on the Master, and we will make it. We're going to endure until the end. I love you, brothers and sisters.